All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and yeah, just make sure you're on mute during the webinar. You can introduce yourself in the chat and put any questions in there as well. Um, and hopefully at the end, we have time to answer a few of them. So this webinar is hosted by Code Pink's China's Not Our Enemy campaign. I'm Megan, the campaign coordinator. Um, you've seen in the past few years, a steep rise in anti-China sentiments in the face of China's success and the shift uh, to a multipolar world order, which is something our government refuses to accept after many years of being the main hegemonic power with essentially uncontested control over the world, world institutions. Um, and the rise of China is threatening to US domination, which is one of the reasons you've seen so much demonization of China from our political leaders and in the media. They're fighting for control of the narrative and in fact just passed a $1.6 billion bill in the house to spread anti-China propaganda overseas. So it's information warfare and it's been going on for a long time. Um, and if we're not careful, the conflict will turn to physical warfare, which is a goal our government seems to be working towards um, as they spend billions and billions of dollars militarizing the Asia Pacific, use, utilizing military and economic coercion against China in the name of US interests. Um, and one thing there's been a lot of misinformation around is China's role in becoming a green energy superpower, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and this coincides with the UN's climate week, climate week that's coming up, and we just wanted to shine our pink light on China and the work that they've been doing to reduce carbon emissions and to protect the planet. Um, and for climate week, we also have a lot of actions going on in New York. I'll put the link in the chat for any of our New York folks. Um, and the webinar also coincides with the Congress's China Week or China Bashing Week, as Bidia put it. They've been working tirelessly all week to pass anti-China legislation. Some 20 out of 30 bills have been passed so far, including the 1.6 billion propaganda bill I mentioned and a variety of others in the House saying, um, you know, saying that China poses the greatest threat to global peace, which simply isn't true. It is, in fact, the U.S. that currently poses the greatest threat, uh, which is evident through our government's complicity in the genocide in Gaza and its actions in Venezuela and funding war in Europe with its escalation of tensions with China and in the Asia Pacific and, sh and so on. Um, and in contrast, China spent all last week hosting diplomatic discussions with African leaders about investing $50 billion into infrastructural and green energy products across uh, the continent. China has passed uh, many of its 2030 climate goals already and is on track to become carbon neutral by 2050. So our guest, Ling Shat, is here to talk about this with us today, along with Code Pink co-founder Jody Evans, who launched both the China's Our Enemy campaign and the War is Not Green campaign at Code Pink, uh, where she's the co-founder. And Ting Shat is a researcher of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and co-editor of Wenhua Zonghen, a journal of contemporary Chinese thought. She is currently pursuing a PhD at Tsinghua University in Beijing. She has also been a part of our Code Pink community for a long time, and you can find more conversations with her on our Code Pink China's Not Our Enemy playlist on YouTube, which I will put in the chat as well. Tings, Jody, welcome. Thank you so much. Let me just make sure we can uh, get Ting's um, highlight, highlight here. <laughs> uh, there she is. I got her. There we go. Hi, Ting's. <laughs> so, nice. Good evening. Good, there we morning. Go. good afternoon. <laughs> uh, Internet, thank you for you know struggling to be here at such an early hour in the morning. Deep gratitude. So. Tings, we just talked about some of the things that are happening right now um, in the U.S., which, it, you know, it's a it's a crazy week that we decided to have this. Uh, but, it you know, it is around this climate week that is coming up. And um, so just deep gratitude. I mean, you are so fabulous to be in conversation with about China. And I was just looking back the last uh, over four years where you've been available to help inform us and keep us smarter. And so you're, you know, everyone at Code Pink is a big fan and we deeply appreciate your work. So um, in focusing on the environment, um, you know, we've, we've got the two campaigns that Code Pink is like, the war is not green and China's not our enemy. 
you know, China's not our enemy is about the propaganda and lies the United States uses, not just on China, but on anyone it wants to go to war with, um, to create an enemy so that it can go to war on them. And all while saying it's trying to fix the climate, knowing that there is no greater contributor to climate change than war. So, you know, it was a very sad day uh, for, for me at least, when John Kerry stepped down from his role as the climate envoy to China, as he had great respect for China. And in the beginning of the Biden administration, a strong advocate for diplomacy with China and not war. I think he got worn down as the days went on and his, his battles as he was losing his battles, but he's been replaced by um, John Podesta, <laughs> that the, I never saw a war or a bomb I didn't like Podesta. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, he was Clinton's chief of staff and founder of the Center for American Progress. After that, that it was the, um, the think tank that ran the White House during Obama, just so everybody wants to know. And he became infamous, infamous uh, when all his emails got leaked by WikiLeaks and you could see what a dastardly uh, dude he was. But last week he visited China to meet with his Chinese counterpart, Liu Xinmin and the foreign minister, Wang Li. So, in the United States news, what we got was China's the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases and shame on them, you know, the finger pointing. Um, well, of course, four fingers were pointing back at the United States. <laughs> but um, no comment on the fact that China's five times larger in population and the manufacturing hub of the world, including in electric cars and solar panels. So I'm just curious before we get into all the other stuff, how did this get reported in China? And would you kind of have any comments about uh, how it got played in the US? First of all, I just want to say thank you, Jody. Uh, thank you, Megan. And thank you to the whole team for of Code Pink to invite me. And it's always a pleasure to, to kind of accompany the work you're doing. And it's really important. You're in the belly of the beast and fighting the good fight. So first of all, thank you. Um, I mean, I think at this point, actually, I didn't see this reported that much, actually, in China. I think at this point, most Chinese people feel quite, um, I don't know, maybe perhaps a little bit just tired of this sort of name calling that happens when it comes to China and climate change, because I think a lot of people, they see some changes that have been happening quite significantly in the last 10, 15 years domestically to help address some of the big climate issues or begin to, you know, there's still lots of struggles ahead, but also this question of, you know, transition to a, a clean energy economy, trying to transition from fossil fuels, which is going to be a long journey. So I think in a way, what, you know, sort of most, I think, uh, US politicians have been saying about China seems to be on a kind of repeat, you know, so it's a bit of the same old, so I'm not sure if it gets a lot of attention anymore. Um, I remember, I think back in, you know, 2010 or something like that when Obama was still president and he was saying something like oh you know if over a billion Chinese people live like Australians and Americans then we'll have a miserable plan to live in it's this kind of similar attitude of like okay well you know uh, it's obviously China's to blame because China's rise is linked to the problems we have in the world not actually the fact what you know, we can go into a bit more in this webinar around the sort of historical ecological debt of the industrialized societies, you know, for the last 200 years, not just the last 30, 40 years that we've seen seeing China rise rapidly economically and as a really production hub of the world. Um, so anyways, I think, I don't think it actually has a huge amount of attention. Is that what I'm trying to say? <laughs> so it's basically the United States used it as to try to one up what actually, you know, to have words instead of real actions and China's got the real actions. So yes, uh, let's find something else we can say negative about China. So yeah, let's let's go further on what you just said about um, you know, the historical growth of China and how that has affected the environment of China because it, we've, I mean, in the 1970s when I was young, you had to eat everything on your plate um, because, uh, children in China were starving. And now we see it as this robust economy. Um, so that ha obviously had some costs, but maybe, you know, take us through what you were just talking about, uh, the, you know, what 
um, John Podesta was saying in relationship to the enormous footprint uh, that the United States has. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to think about where to start. It's a big topic. Um, one of the things is it one of the big shifts that we've seen in the last you know 30 years or so is that yes, the production center of the world has really shifted to China. You know, when we call China the factory of the world, like today, 30 percent of the manufactured goods of China, uh, of the world are produced in China. So this has a huge environmental cost, you know, and of course most of that is born. The brunt of that is borne by the Chinese people. Uh, that's sometimes I think um, not accounted for when we think about what is China's contribution to the global, you know, climate situation. Part of it is that it is producing for the world, and it actually is then responsible for a lot of the emissions that are used to produce things for the world. Um, but that being said, I think um, there has been a pretty strong recognition that these three, four decades of rapid economic growth and industrialization have come out of a significant cost to the environment. Um, and, 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 and actually you can, it's not something that I think, I think most people have recognized. I live in Beijing, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, um, it was really, you know, the era of uh, air apocalypse, not even 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, you know, those days where it's basically between the sandstorms and the pollution was really, really terrible to the point that people called it air apocalypse, right? Many of the top cities in the world, most polluted cities in the world were in China. Today, actually, when you look at the top 10 or 20, I don't even know how many Chinese cities make that list anymore. So that's something that's interesting. And so, for example, I'll just use the example of air quality because I'm, I'm talking about that. Um, so the the there's been significant um, you know efforts on reducing the air quality, especially around the most harmful particle matter, you know PM two point five, um, and the reductions of the last year and is really visible. You know I I went to Beijing the first time in two thousand five, and then I moved there I guess about two and a half years ago, and I I couldn't believe the changes. I couldn't believe it with my own eyes because I thought, wow, this is, you know, I believed in the air apocalypse and it was, it was a really, really bad situation. But in the last 10 years, improvements in the air quality and the efforts made has actually added, and this is really impressive, 2.2 years to the average lifespan of a Chinese person, just the last 10 years. And to do comparison, because we're looking at China and US is that um, just in the last about seven or eight years of the reductions in air um, air pollution um, that China has made is the equivalent to what the U.S. has done in three decades. So improvements in seven years compared to three decades uh, in the U.S. Um, of course, long ways to, you know, Beijing air quality is still not wonderful, you know, although there are more what we call blue sky days or, or excellent air quality days, much more than marked a, a year or, or a decade ago. But still, these are actually one example. We can talk about other things, like whether it's about green areas, reforestation, around areas of water reforestation, and, and including some a place that we've been to called Arhai Lake. Maybe we can talk a little bit about our experience of seeing that, because that's been a really impressive uh, restoration project. But the point I wanted to make is that there is a period right now of um, recognizing that there are aspects of the sort of economic growth pattern that need to be addressed. And that need to be that first of all the environment needs to be restored, um, the parts that have been most damaged, and then also then the second part would be about how to transition towards this um, cleaner energy and new energy economy. I think you're muted, Jody. I don't know how that happened. Um, that's so interesting what you're saying about producing thirty percent of the world's, you know, it's the factory for 30% of the things produced in the world. I mean, that is a crazy number because the item is being used somewhere else. Um, and so China pays for, you know, is assigned the cost, even though the use of it is somewhere else, which is an interesting, you know, how would we, how would we talk about that? Because when you look at the US, the privilege patterns of privileged life are much more the contributor to the cost than the uh, creation of things. Um, so that that's an interesting thing to look at. Um, well, since you touched on Dali um, and you're talking about air quality, 
what's the thing that uh, Chi calls his project? Uh, the um, clean water. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, green mountains and uh, lush, lush mountains and, and green waters. <laughs> There's different <laughs> translations of it. <laughs> They're poetic. <laughs> Lush mountains and green waters. So we, you know, had the privilege to go see Dali and and the lake. And I mean, I heard stories about how devastated it was and really just, you know, close to death, that the water was not drinkable. And matter of fact, was making people sick and, and the um, environment had been trashed. And this was, I think, just like seven years before I got there. And then to come to paradise. So, you know, what can you tell us um, about Dali and what you learned there? But also, is that just a one-off? Is that the only place it's happening? Is this something that the country is committed to in other places? Yeah, I mean, I know that these kind of Chinese slogans, though they're really poetic in Chinese, just doesn't translate into English. And it always ends up sounding kind of ridiculous in English when in Chinese is poetry. So that's just one of the things. <laughs> but the green waters, the lush mountains, actually the second part about it, it's even funnier to translate. It's something like can bring about gold and silver mountains. Um, it's not that it's like everyone, we can get rich off of it, but there is an aspect to it that is linked to the whole question of environmental restoration or environmental or trans you know, the transition to an ecological civilization that what China has been pushing forward as a, a way to think about a, another pattern of development is actually linked to the, um, the efforts around uh, combating poverty. So that's one of the things. How do you use these um, large campaigns around restoring uh, the environment and actually creating more, um, let's say, job opportunities or uh, economic opportunities um, or improve the well-being of the people sort of socially, uh, not just around, you know, having a more comprehensive look in a way around what the environment does and for the livelihoods of the people. That being, uh, so that is a national campaign. You can see these experiences in many places. Um, but um, about Dali, so just to give maybe some context about um, uh, about the place, because maybe some of the people here don't know about it. So uh, Dali is a prefecture in Yunnan, which is a southern province. It's actually an ancient capital. And what's interesting is that it's one of the country's most ethnically diverse areas. Um, just sort of reminding um, everyone that, you know, in China, we have Han people like me, which is over like 95% of the population, but we have actually 55 other ethnic, what, what are called ethnic minorities. Um, and so in this region, the most of the population are actually ethnic minorities, not Han. So it has some very specific characteristics. So one of the things is sort of why, how this lake got um, got so polluted in the last decades is linked to, of course, this uh, 1980s economic reform, but also other factors. So one of the things is that because of the economic reform, you have more in, uh, industries producing fertilizers and pesticides. So this increased the amount of available pesticides fertilizers to use. And of course, that it means that there was a boost in food production, but we all know, you know, that kind of green revolution stuff, it also creates a huge amount of pollution for the water, kind of just went straight into the water basin. Um, and also second to that is that there's hundreds of years where there's a local tradition where local people raise cattle right by the lake. Um, which means that all that waste coming from the cattle raising goes right into the lake and then causes eutrophication. So that was also exacerbating the problems. Um, plus other things where there was a kind of burgeoning tourism industry. So people were starting to build guest houses right on the lake as well. So some of them were human uses. Some of them were around how to apply these sort of um, new agricultural sort of fertilizers and chemicals. So there was all sorts of aspects um, that were involved in why this lake got so polluted and basically was almost dead, as you say. Um, so what has happened in the last 20 years and um, with a huge boost in the last 10 years was different you know, policies from the government to address this issue. And this is where I think sometimes this, when we say, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics, you know, has these Chinese characteristics, is that it becomes a bit of a mobilization, not only in the local area, especially in the last 10 years, is a mobilization in a more national sense. So you would bring, for example, scientists, uh, specific scientists that would be basically transferred to live by Ur High Lake to study the situation. 
there's a whole campaign that requires, you know, obviously led by the party because this is a campaign, the government is led by the party, um, where you'd have to convince also local people of different ways of producing and grazing, you know, even if they might be some traditional ways of grazing, there are actually, in terms of scientifically, better ways to graze, um, which would be uh, less damaging to the environment, to the lake, also more env environmentally ways of producing. Uh, and then also there would be um, really interesting things like uh, they called them scientific courthouses that were established with the China Agriculture University. These are sort of small study, like, let's say, research centers where they would bring a lot of students to live and work and actually understand what producing in the countryside looks like to be able to apply the things that they've been studying to figure out how is it that we can, you know, use different types of organic fertilizers, produce those fertilizers. How do we locate the sources of pollution, work with the local peasant farmers to, to sort of adjust these mechan you know, ways of producing, et cetera, et cetera. So it, I, I mean, I think so this is just one of the things that's really impressive of sort of different sectors of society that get brought together to be able to address this issue, because the whole point is that protecting the environment can improve the economic situations of people in the long term, right? But in the long term, to have that long term sort of collective vision, you have to actually make a lot of um, maybe sacrifices for inter individual short term gains, you know, like, for example, how to convince these um, people who are running guest houses right on the lake that it's not, not a good idea to actually, you know, build a house right on the lake where all your waste goes directly into the lake and have start to restore some of the areas right around the lake to its, you know, conservation areas. And I, I know I'm going on a little bit, but I had a chance to meet, I think you actually did, did too, Jody, um, a former fisherman named Mr. He. I think you might have met him as well, perhaps on your trip. But he he was talking about, and it's really impressive because he was a fisherman and he lived through these 20 years of these changes, uh, you know, and he was personally affected in different ways, you know, when, for example, the first period where um, the government was saying, okay, we have to fish um, electric motorized boats, um, and fishing boats, because that's causing a certain amount of pollution. He actually was individually affected because he had to sell his fishing boat, you know, and then he went to work and then he started doing building fish ponds. And then later on in another phase, well, fish ponds are also causing uh, a lot of pollution in this th lake. So he had to stop that. He had a sort of small little guest house on the lake that also had to stop because that was, you know, he went through these phases and you would think someone like him would be just absolutely frustrated with the government because, you know, he has basically had to make his personal sacrifices, even though the now the lake is completely, you know, green again, or no, not green again, but like, you know, uh, alive again and 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 has had three four years in a row of excellent water quality but then when you talk to him he he was one of those people that gets sort of convinced along the way that this is ultimately for the greater good he saw a lot of people being lifted out of poverty in these restoration efforts he saw that now there's a different path to use the lake to generate a whole to sort of stimulate a whole set of um kind of economic uh um uh opportunities in the region that aren't linked to sort of these short-term gains. Eventually his family was uh, along with 100 and 1,805 other families were actually relocated in a, uh, to a slightly farther out away from the sort of areas from the, from the lake region. And, and now he's been able to start um, organic rice farming. Long story short, I thought it was really interesting to talk to someone like him to see how someone like him gets brought along in this whole process. It's not like everyone's like, okay, great, there's a government policy and we're very happy and there's going to be, you know, everyone just, you know, comes out without any kind of personal kind of sacrifices along the way. And just final, final tidbit thing and the last thing I think he told us was that after all these you know, trials and tribulations. Now his family is actually doing pretty well. He's very, very involved in the community and promoting sort of these these um, these local efforts. And he's actually applied um, to become a member of the Communist Party of China after all of this. So he was also really convinced and motivated by seeing the leadership of the party in the region to kind of stimulate these these efforts. But I mean, Jody, you were there, so you got to see firsthand what what it was like. Maybe the the results of all those efforts in the last 20 years, maybe not what it looked like 20 years ago. Wow, that's so, thank you so much. You always bring us straight into what's happening and, and the complexities of it. 
That's fascinating. I didn't realize like how long and how many, you know, things had to keep changing. But, you know, it was there too that I really recognized the local peace economy in the sense of um, there was a pride from most of the people I met or all the people I met, but, it, you know, I didn't meet everyone, but there was a pride of creation. There was a pride that had made this paradise happen. And um, so I was interested in both the, you know, and some people said, well, Beijing gave us the money, but we made it happen. And I, I loved that, you know, like relationship to place and pride um, of really, you know, having something be horrible to have it be paradise, which it literally is. And then just the joy of, of everyone living there. There's a, a path that goes around the lake that you can ride your bike on. And the, the joy in the women, um, especially the older women as they would be riding their bicycles or uh, the, they had the ones where they would sit in the back and some guy in the front would be riding. And I just, I would just feel joy just witnessing their joy. So there, I, I found something also in the co-creation um, that it wasn't just about money, which gets thrown up problems in the United States, but it was about holding the space for something to happen that was going to be difficult, but you were going to see it through um, to the end. Um, instead of a, <laughs> the only things we see happen in our communities are football stadiums um, that steal from the people and destroy the environment. Um, but uh, yes, it is it is paradise and a beautiful um, example of this. But um, I think there's there's so many other things. Um, you know, uh, we've read about like the tree planting. Is, is there is that um, is that countrywide? Is that specific? What are people thinking about it? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the tree planting because. It's been it's something that we we looked into a little bit um, in when we looked at the study of poverty alleviation. Um, we published it in Tricontinental about four years ago because we went to another region, also historically quite poor region called Guizhou, and were able to uh, learn about the poverty alleviation efforts. But one of the things um, was realizing that oh, poverty alleviation was very linked to uh, you. One of the ways out of poverty was these ecological restoration projects and, and and being able to bring in a lot of people whether it's to become a uh, planting trees or even being you know uh basically uh, people who work in the forests or protecting the, these cons conservation areas but one of the things i think people don't realize is how much this reforestation has been a, a global impact so just to have a sense there was this actually nasa did the through the satellites um was able to track since 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2020, uh, China uh, created a quarter of the world's uh, new green areas. So this is either new forests or forests that have been restored. Uh, so reforestation or afforestation is creation of new forests or new green areas. So that's 25% of the world's new green areas in 20 years were because of China's uh, tree planting efforts. Um, and one of the things is, of course, you know, in this, um, China has made the announcement uh, a few years ago in 2020 that it'll it'll reach um, uh, carbon peak in 2030 and everything looks like it's going to be before that time and then reach carbon neutrality by 2060. So tree planting has also been a big part of, of this. So, for example, I think it was last year there was another um, announcement made that there would be another 33 million hectares of forest and grassland to be planted by next year. So it's been a continuous aspect of it. But back to this poverty question is that during um, the poverty alleviation campaign, when we talk about the poverty alleviation campaign, it's really the what's called the targeted poverty alleviation campaign under Xi since 2014 to 2020, where the last uh, 100 million people living in extreme poverty exited extreme poverty through a very intensive uh, countrywide effort. And, and, and for tree planting, about 400,000 people uh, were actually employed and created jobs linked to these efforts around forestry conservation. So this was also one of this kind of aspects of thinking about how do we how do we create um, um, jobs for, and also protect the environment at the same time linked to this poverty campaign. So it's really impressive in the ways that um, uh, the street planting and and actually I had a friend who just went to Inner Mongolia 
I went in Mongolia also about 20 years ago, and I'm really excited. I hope I have a chance to go again. But the 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 Inner Mongolia is being one of the regions because it's a desert area and desertification has been a big, big problem. That's partly why we have those sandstorms that arrive in Beijing is because of the desertification that blows a lot of those uh, sandy regions. But huge swaths of those areas have just been basically turned the desert green. And it's really impressive to see. Wow. Well, I mean, every time you answer a question, what I feel or hear is the win-win. Um, you know, is really the, that how do we do this in a way, how do we make these shifts? Uh, you know, it's kind of like in the United States, we're always fighting things, but never really planning. What is the shift that has to happen to get us from here to there and plan that and follow through on it? So yet another win-win that also I feel like connects to the values in Chinese culture that I've, I've really learned over the last four years, which is that interconnection between the earth and people. And, and also, you know, I think as we saw with the China Africa coming together, that the the connection of everyone, you know, the, that it's about connection, not separation. And so here we're seeing that connection where people's lives are made better as the earth is made better. So, so beautiful. Um, and also there's the part about uh, getting something done. So in the seventies, um, I, you know, 50 years ago, I was the director of administration in Jerry Brown's cabinet. He was the governor of California. And I oversaw the governor's office and all the projects under it. And one of them was the newly created and only office like it globally, the Office of Appropriate Technology that promoted alternative energy sources. And it was under this office that wind energy was developed. You know, lots of history has been written about it, um, using tax credits, supporting those that were doing the research, um, creating uh, co uh, collaborations and convenings uh, so that, you know, the technology could move fast instead of be competitive, be collaborative. And so uh, it also was the support of uh, solar energy development. Um, so much so that uh, when President Carter won, he stole our director um, who put solar panels on the White House. But I just want to say that was 50 years ago. <laughs> so we had these answers 50 years ago. And, you know, China's growing and it's, it. can you talk about the iteration? Uh, you know, that, you know, in the United States, all that got like stopped by oil companies and you know the 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 lobbying capacity of the war economy on decision makers stopped the possibility for us to uh, not have this climate change we're all suffering in some ways. So um, I, I just maybe a little bit about iterating and also just the planning executing, which I know. For you, probably feels normal, but in the United States, it's it's why nothing happens, including uh, high speed trains. Yeah, I mean, I think this is interesting. I don't know actually when um, I was looking at this at at least in Europe. I think in the nineteen seventies is when the carbon peak happened. You know, it says something about the stage of industrialization. You know, I'm assuming in the U.S. is probably similar. Um, so when you say 50 years, there's been 50 years of possibility to actually make a real energy transition, right? But I don't think we've seen much of that. And in fact, it's interesting going back to the sort of announcement of the carbon neutrality that, you know, I think it's really ambitious for China to say, okay, 2060. I think for EU, it's 2050, you know, which is saying that these are, China hasn't even peaked yet, but is trying to already think about the way out. Um we have countries in the industrialized world or in the advanced capitalist societies that have 50 years and are very far from that reality. So I think there's something to say, not not even taking account of uh, all the historical ecological debt that the advanced capitalist societies are responsible for. That being said, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture to say that China has an easy task ahead. I mean, yes, like at least you know, somewhere around 28% of the world's greenhouse gases are emitted in China, you know, obviously because of it's production, many, many things. Um, it's still the largest user of coal. You know, coal is a big basis of the energy source till today. Um, so in terms of how uh, to reach 
this carbon neutrality means that you have to make some significant shifts and we're starting to see, and it has to be quick too. Um, so one of the things we've seen in this sort of new energy transition, obviously huge investments in production of new energy um, sources, the technologies, electric vehicles, we can go into that a bit because it's been causing a lot of consternation in the West. Um, one of the things is that now, I think the last report I saw actually by Global Energy Monitor, um, an NGO you guys will know well, based in the US, said that China produced almost twice as much wind and solar energy capacity than the rest of the world combined. The rest of the, that means every other country in the world put together and China has produced twice as much wind and solar capacity. Um, so the US is the second, but for, like a lot trailing second, you know? Um, so we're looking at something like over 160 gigawatts of wind, 180 gigawatts of turbine, wind turbines, um, of solar, sorry. Whereas the US is something like trying to build 40. So it's a huge gap between the China's leadership and then where, where the US is, which is the second in the world. And today, of course, the production of world solar panels, I think over 70%, if not three quarters of the world solar panels produced here, uh, most of the wind turbines. Um, if you see, I mean, going into major cities in, in China now, you know, you, you'll hear you'll hear how quiet the cities are because of the transition to elect electric vehicles and electric buses, you know. Um, most of the buses, um, I think almost like 95, 98% of the electric buses produced in the world are produced here. Um, and then electric vehicles now, we know that it's been a big, big issue. People are now complaining, okay, China's produced electric vehicles. Now it's overconsumption and trying to sell sell it to the rest of the world. But anyways, that's another another question. Um, but I think, so that's, that's one of really impressive things we've seen, a huge investment um, and a huge jump in the technological capacities of looking at wind, solar, and electric uh, um, uh, sources of energy, but also the technologies that are now on the streets here are being used. Uh, but it's still a long ways to go to actually replace and to find the reliable energy um, sources throughout the year that can be consistent enough because that's some of the problems with wind and solar sometimes um, that can, you know, replace coal uh, in the next, I guess, 30 years or so. Um, one of the things I think is also going to be a challenge, and I know a lot of people think about this and it's important is around the resource extraction question, right? Because all these new energy technologies, be it wind, solar, electric cars, require a lot of raw materials, you know, lithium being a big part of it. So there's been a lot of discussion around how do you achieve lithium self-sufficiency through recycling of the materials that go into it. So now there's been actually one of the largest um, lithium battery producers is called CATL or CATL. Um, now is the very recently, actually, one of the main sort of the CEO of Cattle was saying that he thinks that because of the recycling technologies um, that China's battery needs, uh, mineral needs can be sort of self-sustained uh, by 2042. Even now, there's already quite a bit of um, recycling technologies can recycle up to 70, 80 percent of the batteries to produce new ones. And at the same time, I think looking into other sort of non-lithium sources like there's one that's already in the second generation which is using sea salt you know using salt sodium iron iron batteries instead of um using lithium so anyways i think the big question is is a key one because um you know resources and sort of resource sovereignty is a big question for many global south countries and how to use that towards your own country's development as opposed to just yeah another way to sort of destroy the world right so the environment as well well, you just talked about, you know, recycling. Maybe you can just give us a little window into how important that is and how people participate in it. And I'm always fascinated when I'm there, the seriousness with which recycling is taken and how supportive it is to everyone to participate in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is really new. And I was just watching a documentary. Unfortunately, I don't think it has English version. Um, but one of the things was focusing on basically lives of different people. One of them was um, someone who was tasked to in the, like a few years ago when the recycling program started arriving in the cities to basically convince local communities to use it. And it was all about the challenges of convincing people that now you sort 
you know, sort um, um, garbage into your know, organics, your recycling, you know, and how much resistance there was actually in communities because they're like, we don't want our garbage right in front of our houses, like sort of lying, you know, like sort of in these bins right in front of our houses. We don't like the look of it. We like the, you know, sort of hide it, not having to see it. So that was just interesting. It's just more of an anecdote to see, oh, wow, what I'm benefiting now in my community where there is recycling and there is compost, you know, recycling as well, um, came as a process also of like, you know, advocating, convincing and, and making it um, uh, sort of adapted to a community. So now I think most communities, especially in places like uh, major cities like Shanghai and Beijing and others, you know, um, there is basically community level organized um, uh, recycling. You have your, you know, your green bin, you have your blue bin, you have your, you know, non-recyclables. And there's also people who get employed in the local community um, that help with, with that, you know. Um, so it's actually, yeah, I think um, in different communities, it's still uh, still an adjustment period because I would say it's in the last 10 years where recycling became a, even an idea uh, in people's minds. And now it's become more of a habit, um, uh, more of an everyday habit, especially in the big cities. I think you're muted again. That's so weird that it keeps happening. I was just remembering like five years ago when it... Um you were just getting all those separation bins and it was a new thing and people were trying to figure it out. And I've, I've just been blown away by how it becomes a whole, here we are to help you make this happen. And, um, and uh, knowing it's going to be difficult. So we know we have to support you in the process. I think it's that part that we know we need to support you through the process, not a wag, not the finger wagging, but the, how do we help you do this? Um, because it's for all of us. It's another one of the win-wins. Um, so in the United States, we think like imperialists and we're never really aware of it. But, um, and one of the things we do then is expecting others to behave like us, which is this war economy, um, you know, the big problem for people and, plan and the whole planet. So can you just give us a, a little bit into China's alternative path to development and mod modernization for global South countries that is, you know, uh, gets deconstructed by our uh, propaganda news to be named something else, but it, but it's like what you've been describing. It's a process to get somewhere and um, it doesn't fit imperialist thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's on a path to figuring out what could be, let's say another way, another model, um, at least that works for China, um, to modernize that isn't going to follow the same sort of Western capitalist logic. What is the Western capitalist logic, which is modernization or what we see of the industrialization of the global North, let's call it, or the advanced capitalist societies has come at a cost of hundreds of years of colonization and plundering and the extraction of wealth and resources and labor from the global South or the former colonized world to build these, you know, the major cities of the North. And that can't be the model that sort of, certainly not the model that China wants to do. And I don't think it's the model that any other country, and it's not the pathway out of underdevelopment, which most global South countries are still confronting today. So there is a new set, new, new pathway, you know? Yes, people, you know, wonder, oh, is China's rise, is it really socialist? Is it really capitalist? Is it a new colonization, a colonial, colonial power, many things. But one of the things is, one of the things is, well, it doesn't come at the cost of colonization uh, or colonial wars or imperial wars or the occupation of other people's lands or the overthrowing of people's, you know, democratically elected governments or, you know. So there's many other aspects of that. So one thing is not treading this path of sort of plundering uh, of other countries. But at the same time, I think there's something more structural because what has been the sort of globalization model that the West and all these sort of multinational or led by these multinational companies uh, you know, in the world done in the last 40 years, it's usually come where uh, these companies come, multinational companies come to the global south. Uh, they possess the technologies. They might start a factory because they like the, you know, cheap resources and cheap labor. Um, but they possess the technologies. They run all the management. They run the, they, they control the capital and all the 
production equipment, and then they reap all the high profits off of that value chain, you know? Um, but, and then what happens? The developing countries that provide the resources and labor basically suffer the environmental pollution costs. And then also the workers will never get to buy the things that they ever produce. This is very common to see in like, for example, in the 1990s in China, you know, uh, the Chinese factories, like, of course, the Chinese factory workers could not buy those iPhones or whatever. I mean, 1990s, there weren't iPhones, but, you know, the high, high, the kind of more complex or advanced goods. But this isn't a model I think that China wants to reproduce. And so this is one of the things I, I'll use the electric vehicle um, um, example, because now there are a Chinese electric vehicle factories that are being opened in other places. Um, for example, in Brazil, the BYD has opened up factories now. And what are these? I think these are different attempts, a different model. For example, these are joint ventures with Brazilian companies or that they would be technology transfers. I think that's a big part of a difference is that there's technology transfers so that developing countries or countries of the global south can also figure out a way to learn from these experiences, the same way that China also learned from the experiences, learned from the knowledge and the technology and the science to be able to produce and today be a competitor and even, you know, leading in, a, in, a, in an advanced, you know, areas such as, you know, um, electric vehicles or artificial intelligence or other areas that, you know, I think the West is feeling very, very conflicted about because it was okay to sort of cheap, pr produce the cheap goods like uh, to supply to the rest of the world, but it's not okay when you start to innovate in the, you know, the, 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 the say higher value chain products. Um, and so one of the things and and so back to the the uh, electric vehicles. So yes, there's technology transfers and also producing cars that you know at at prices that could be affordable to working people. Um, and I think that's a big part, you know, because it's not enough to just say, um, you know, build the factories in other places. But if people can't can even you know the workers themselves cannot even buy the goods, that's a different that's a model of, of also modernization that's not very helpful for a possible development path. And I had um and a story that my partner who's Brazilian, he, you know, um, you know him very well. Um, he was in Brazil recently and he took an Uber and he was talking to the Uber driver and he was actually in um in a BYD car. And it was really interesting. He tells the story way better than I do, but it was basically the Uber driver was saying he was starting to get really excited to show him all the features of this car. You know, he's like, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this. And he says, oh, you know, look at that car that's coming by. It's a Renault, you know, the French car. He says, Renault is more expensive than this car, but it's basically just, you know, it's like metal over, you know, it, there's nothing, there's no features, nothing. And then he was talking about how in this electric, you know, hybrid car, basically, in two years from the from the savings, from the fuel costs, he can pay back the car already because at an affordable price for, you know, an average worker to be able to pay. And I think that says something, you know, who can buy uh, an electric car in a country like Brazil and also see sort of the kind of benefits to their lives. And I think there's something there that also says uh, a possibility. And I think hopefully in the future, this is also a part of stimulating um, Brazil's economic, our own electric vehicle production uh, and innovation, you know, in the future as well. So let's see. I mean, I don't want to paint a too optimistic picture of it, but I think there's a fundamentally different approach uh, to how China wants to modernize and relate to the global south, recognizing it is a global south country. It is still in the process of development and will always come from this sort of history of being a global south and former colonized country. So it relates very differently than, say, the global north countries would um, in relation to the interests of you know mutual development. Very important point. Thank you so much for that. Well, is there anything else uh, you want to give us a sneak peek into the upcoming Wen Hao Zhongheng issue? How do, how do you say that? <laughs> Wen Hao Zhongheng. Yeah, I know it's a little bit tricky, but it'll be good. It helps train our, you know, our muscles. <laughs> you do so much better on Dong <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, actually, some of the things I brought today um, are going to be coming out in our next issue. Uh, so it's actually very timely. We're having this webinar. Um, it's going to come out in December, an issue. So just to step back a bit, Ohan Zhonghang is a, a collaboration we've been doing uh, through Dongsheng and Tricontinental with a um, one of the leading uh, uh, left and progressive magazines or uh, called Wenhua Zhonghang. It came out about two, in 2008, and it's been a very influential to bring different levels of 
debates and discussions from China. And what we find is that there's really lacking sort of Chinese voices uh, and perspectives, uh, whether or not you agree with them, but just to enter the debate. So what we started doing last year is bringing some of the articles that we think have particular relevance, you know, to the world, but in particular to Global South, and um, putting them in dialogue with, with scholars from yeah, Global South. So the next issue in December is focused on the environment question. Uh, so there's an article that I helped co-write about this uh, Arhai or Dali experience uh, after visiting and being able to understand the deeper this this process and the science behind it. Um, there's also one article that's really interesting about actually very much this question of the development or the history of the development of the electric vehicle industry in China and, and having some uh, reflections on what this means for, for Global South uh, and this, what what the author is saying is a new type of globalization that's possible. Um, and so uh, there's also another uh, article that looks at sort of the, the changing perspectives on this environmental question in the last 20 years, because 20 years ago was really not something that the average Chinese person was aware of and, until today. So anyways, I invite um, uh, any of the people who are participating here to check it out when it comes out, because it's all available to download in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And it'll be available on the Tricontinental website. Uh, and the idea is exactly to stimulate discussions like this to kind of help uh, 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 bring some, you know, more substantial content and analysis from China, not so much just the talking points or, or you know, uh, kind of get behind, you know, that 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 kind of smoke screen, right? And so, and we, and if anyone here gets a chance to read it, let us know what you think, and 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 hope it's useful uh, for the discussions. Oh, thank you so much. And um, also, if any of you, um, Tings has a wealth of information about China. Um, and if you missed her last week at No Cold War, um, Megan will post that here where she covers other questions and we've been able to address today. And I think it's it's short and sweet and, and really uh, nourishing. I say flossing. It helps splash your mind from all the, the uh, propaganda. And there's more of things on our Code Pink YouTube channel under our China's Not Our Enemy playlist, where we have 74 other teach-ins like this one today. Um, you know, the this week they voted a billion six to you know float more propaganda out there. So protect yourself from <laughs> from the influx of more and more propaganda across the globe. Um, we have a few minutes left. If there are any questions, uh, put them in the chat really quickly. I didn't see any above. I, I did like what um, Steve put, that the West is finance capitalism and BRICS is development capitalism. Um, <laughs> so uh, any, um, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, Tings, do you have any final words you want to add? Or Megan, do you have anything else you want to leave us with? Yeah, sure. Uh, if Tings doesn't have anything else she wants to add, I can close us out. Tings, you want to? Thank you so much, Tings. We love you so much. Thank you for how freaking smart and brilliant you are and that you do it with, uh, you know, really the roots into culture and art. It is where we change and learn from. So thank you so much. Thanks much for inviting me and look forward to all the good work you all do at Code Pink. And I'll see you soon. See you. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Great. laughs> You'll see a bunch of us soon. <laughs> yeah, that'll be wonderful. I'm looking forward to meet you all here. Okay. Um, Megan, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you, Tings, for taking the time so early to come talk to us about these issues in such a chaotic, tense time. Um, you know, it's really critical now more than ever that we protect our minds from the propaganda, from being manipulated to support the war abroad. Um, it's also really important to support our local Asian communities as they face this rising hate because of the actions of our government and media, especially with all this new discriminatory discriminatory uh, anti-Asian legislation that's being passed in the House. Um, and, you know, climate change is an ex existential threat to all of us. Um, we all know it and working towards, you know, becoming carbon neutral, cultivating local peace economies like there are in China and supporting green energy projects around the, around the globe. 
Um, it's it's absolutely critical. And as two of the most powerful countries, U.S. and China, need to work together to prevent any more damage to the environment, which will never happen if our government stays on its path, accelerating us towards a new Cold War with China. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about China, you can check out some of our resources that I put in the chat. And I'll also send up I send out a follow-up email with the, with the resources and you can get more involved with the campaign at codepink.org slash China or send me an email at megan at codepink.org. So thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you for joining us so much. Thank you, Tings, and thanks all of you for being peacemakers. Much thank needed you. right now. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.